so confused. Like, who have I been hanging out with this whole time? I'm ready to live. I'm ready to love. I was kind of in a funk. Couldn't access my creativity. It's our time to live our life. And then I met you, and that all went away. you reduce the world down, we're all just one big organism. What we do has an effect on others. Ken, hello from Las Vegas. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Oh, my pleasure. Right one. Boy, I needed a comedy. I needed a romantic, quirky comedy, and this was it. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think, the, I think the whole country needs a romantic, quirky comedy right oh, now. Oh, absolutely, I absolutely. Uh, well, essentially, this is a Seattle story, isn't it? Finding love, two very dysfunctional people. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. That You kind of nailed it right there in a log line. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I, you know, being uh, someone who went to film school, you know, I mean, screenwriting class, always write what you know about. So how much of Godfrey are you? <laughs> you know, actually, none. Uh, you know, I'll tell you the, 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 the way I came up with this, this story. It, came, it came, actually came from two sources. Um, it came, one, it came from my fascination with uh, the late actor Peter Sellers, right? The Pink Panther series, blah, 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 you know, being there. I loved Peter Sellers. And the interesting thing about Peter is, you know, Jeffrey, as being a film critic, that he was a brilliant mimic. He could play any character. He could play a Southerner. He could play a Cockney guy. He could play an Indian character. Whoever he played, it was like seamless. Like he disappeared into that role. But what a lot of people don't really realize is that in real life, when Peter wasn't playing a role, he didn't know who he was. He literally was like this cipher who only came to life when he took on a film role. And so I find that really, I found that really fascinating about him. And I said, what would cause a man to have such a weak sense of self-identity? And then I said, you know, it had to probably come from some sort of trauma that he had that would have caused him to be that way. So that really started making me think. And then a few years ago, I read this article, uh, I think in the New York Times about this very big social influencer and how she quit all of a sudden. And the reason she said she quit was because everything she was posting on like Instagram was fake. And she couldn't deal with the pressure anymore. And that really started making me think about identity in our society right now and how I think, you know, social media in a way has kind of corrupted identity. Like we're all posting fake versions of ourselves online. You know, we're all doing this very curated version of ourselves. So when I kind of took that idea and I took the idea of Peter, I put them together, I kind of came up with Godfrey. With yeah, the, Peter the right Sellers. Guy. Yeah, the mouse, the reward, you know, uh, yeah. Dr. Strangelove, he played yes. all these different, even did recordings of Beatles songs with different voices, you know, so he was, exactly. yeah, all those different ones. So casting Godfrey had to be essential for this movie. So finding someone who could do all those different characters, was Nick always your first choice? Uh, that's a very good question, Jeffrey. Um, <laughs> the, the truth is, I had written this script for a very specific act actor who I won't name this actor. And... I wrote it and I sent it to the actor and that actor loved the script. And he said, I'm gonna do it. And so I had the actor and then I had the female lead who had a relationship with that actor. And then, you know, funnily enough, as happens in a lot of these indie films or in a lot of films in general, I'm up in Vancouver prepping the movie and six weeks before we're about to start shooting, the guy drops out. Oh no. And because he dropped out, my female lead dropped out. So I did not have um, my two leads for this movie. Uh, hold on one second. I'm sorry. So I did not have two leads for this movie. Luckily, I was big fans of, you know, um, uh, Nick and Cleo that we quickly scrambled to get them. And we finally got both of them into the film literally two weeks before we started shooting. Unbelievable. Yeah, because Cleo, um, Cleo has this, like, this aura about her. She's yes. essentially like a muse-like quality. I mean, she's there's just something about her. I'm a huge fan of Last Man on Earth. I mean, I watch that yeah. show religiously. And right. when, I, when I see her in a movie though, where she has a chance to really show her talent, you know, there was just something about her that was hypnotic. Yeah, you know, I think what really surprised me about Cleo, because I was a big fan of her on Last Man on Earth as, as well, was her comedy chops. Like, she was really great in that show, but she really blossomed in, in this film. And what was so interesting about it is that 
I was so surprised by her comedic abilities that I ended up rewriting her part during shooting to better fit her comedic skills. Um, and so it was such a great surprise to, to have that with Cleo and she was so great to work with. I really loved her. And when she, uh, when she met her ex in the park, you know, that, that when you, and you looked at her face, she was like, you know, just see it, that scene kept building and building and she did these facial expressions. She did all yeah. these things. Did you let her just go like, you know, improv that? Uh, well, it's, it's funny you bring up that scene, Jeffrey, because that was the scene where I realized what I had with Cleo. It was literally like the third day of shooting with her. That park scene I had written, it was funny, but it, it but I let her improv a little bit on that scene as I did with the other actors. And we got this great material out of it. And that's when I stopped between takes and I pulled Cleo aside. And I said, I did not know you had these chops. I literally did not know you had these chops and you're changing the tone of the film because before that, the film was kind of more like a dramedy with some comedic elements to it. But now with Cleo being able to deliver comedy and Nick and then Eliza, it changed the tone of the film to this really fun, lighter film. Uh, and that's the scene where I, that, that I realized that, Jeffrey. And, you know, um, Lisa Schlesinger, I mean, what a ball of energy. Again, she looked like she had to improv some of her one-liners. I did, I, I did allow her to improv some of the stuff. Um, the scene at the end of the movie where they're in the, the book agent's office and they're getting the deal signed, I really cut them loose in, in a couple of these takes. So there's a lot of dialogue in there that really just came out of Eliza and out of the, the actress that played opposite of her, this woman named Amy Goodmurphy, who's super funny as well. She's a Vancouver actress, but super talented. So to see those two women go at it with each other in this kind of improv scene was just terrific. And you know, I wrote the role of Kelly for Eliza. I'm a huge Eliza Schlesinger fan. And she not only delivered, she went above and beyond what I really thought she was going to do in that role. I, I really think she's going to get, kind of be a breakout. Uh, there's going to be a breakout movie for her. And, you know, both of us being fans of Last Man on Earth, Cleo has this thick Australian accent. How did she overcome that to be have this American accent? Right? I mean, uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. She's just, you would not be able to tell. And the funny thing is, there's another Australian actor in the film, a guy named MJ Coculus, who plays Godfrey's brother, Shad. And he's an Aussie. And so when we're in between takes and we're sitting, you know, having lunch and I'm talking with Cleo and MJ, they're back in their thick Australian accents. But then when, you know, I, I, I say action, they've got it nailed. You should have softened him up a little bit. You know, he was too tough the entire film. I was hoping towards <laughs> the end of the movie, he'd start, but every time he'd get in her face and, you know, I'm like, yeah. man, that's heavy. I mean, what does this guy do to say, look, you're making my brother happy. You know, I thought he would, but he never broke. He was just a street tough guy that just made me so uncomfortable <laughs> he was so protective of his brother and and so distrustful and I think that's where that that came from that you know it takes a lot for kids like that you know especially if you know these three kids to kind of let their guard down yeah and how many times did you make them sing Achy Breaky Heart I mean we know how films are made you shoot all day did they sing that like a hundred times for you every time yeah. they cut away to it I'm like oh my god they're singing that song all day yeah yeah you are right Jeffrey we, we had them sing them sing that song probably at least 40 times you know with all the coverage we did on the film you know when the close-ups to the masters and everything in between so they really got to know that song uh you know inside and out I have to mention David Ketchner. He's one of my all-time favorites. He has very little screen time in your movie, but my God, does he make the most of it? Uh, you know, that's another role I wrote specifically for an actor. I wrote that role for David. When I was actually writing the script, I had a photo of David above my desk uh, just to really keep the character in lockstep with, with who David was. And like I said, he was terrific in the film. You're right, Jeffrey, he's, he's got a smaller role in the film but it really pops and you really remember from the movie. Like, I love that guy. You know, I've been to Seattle in years and I kept watching the movie and I'm like, man, I gotta make a pilgrimage back there because I love riding that monorail. <laughs> like, you really <laughs> utilize Seattle a lot. And I think that was really a big character in the movie too. And uh, great romantic comedy, you know? So uh, I'm glad you focus on the oddballs because that, they always make the best stories. Yeah, no, thank you, thank you. You know, I thought it was kind of like, this movie is kind of a different take uh, on the romantic comedy. Uh, it's not the usual type of fare that you see for romantic comedy, but I think the most important thing for me is like, 
you know, it's sweet, it's funny, but the most important thing is like, it's a feel good movie. And I think, you know, as you said at the beginning of this interview, Jeffrey, like 2020 was such a horrible year. I think people are desperate for a feel good film because I think once you watch this movie, you feel a little bit you know, better about humanity and you feel that, you know, you feel good about yourself, you know, when you watch it. So I'm really hoping people find this film. Well, hopefully you're from the rave scene because uh, being here in Las Vegas, we go to EDC and everything and DJ Katamine, that was, just, I have some raver friends. I just absolutely thought that was hysterical. They were watching it with me. And uh, so <laughs> they, they, I think that they're going to steal that name. So just be prepared. You'll see EDC this summer, key, you know, DJ Katamine. So. I, I'm sure I, it will. I'm, I'm very happy if somebody adopts that name. <laughs> Ken, thank you so much and good luck. And let's talk again soon and come visit us in Las Vegas when you have a chance when things are safe. Absolutely, Jeffrey. And, and thank you for having me again. I appreciate it.